morning, everyone. All right, I got about three. I'm going to take me a couple more weeks. I'm going to get one time. <laughs> we are so glad you are here. We're glad to be here this morning. We are um, just blessed to be in his presence. Amen. You know, it's always a great day whenever you can come together on a Sunday and just celebrate the Lord. Amen. And just come together as the body of Christ and with your church family and, and just be able to set our eyes on him and just take time to worship him. And uh, so we just invite you to just stand with us if you want. You don't have to stand. If you want to sit, you can sit too. But just enter into his presence this morning. Amen.
morning. Do you believe that you serve a God who is mighty and he's faithful, amen? Nothing that we bring before him is impossible for him this morning, amen?
sing a little louder than before. can hold you. No chains can hold you. The blood of Jesus covered you, washed you of your sins, set you right before him, made you upright, 
lined you up with the Father, made you an heir to the throne. If y'all didn't need that or want it, I'll take it. Mm. Thank you, Father, for our freedom. Thank you, Father, for our freedom. Thank you, Father, for our freedom. Thank you that you break the, t the chains, Father, that no man can put us under. That we're the head, we're not the tail. We are blessed, we are called by you. We walk in favor this morning. Hallelujah, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Wow. God is good, God is good, God is so good. We are so, so happy that you are here with us this morning. We are so happy whether you're here in this building or you guys are joining us down in mission today or even online. Um, um, to, you're going to hear more about and just hear in a little bit, but we're actually launching the church down in mission today. And so they'll be joining us here in a little bit. There was now, but <laughs> we're going to get to share with them here in just a little bit. We're going to give you some time just to greet each other. I know if you want to do the distancing thing, that's okay, you know, but if you want to high five or fist pump or something <laughs> with your neighbors, we're going to give you just a minute to greet each other and just stay in the presence of God. Man, he is just so good this morning. Amen. Praise God. Sometimes we have so many different 
a veces nos tenemos que aprender para mí, para nosotros. So, so as we were trying to get this going, uh, like I said, we, we were trying to open our second campus, and my dad's really excited to open it. You know, God's been really doing a lot of work this year. He's been really kind of planning everything that needed to be planted, but obviously we still need some technological advances to make that as buttery smooth as possible. So we're getting there. You, you see the fruits of our labor. We're, we're close. We're really close. Hey, look at me. Hello, look at that handsome guy. Anyway, uh, so you see the fruits of our labor. We're almost there. We're nearly there, but we are just kind of shy of it. So this is what we are focusing on. This is what we call visions. When we five minutes, so I need to hurry. So, uh, so we have all this stuff that we are wanting to do for the kingdom of God to advance it. But as you can see, there's holes in the process. There's holes. There's people that we are missing to help us achieve those goals. And who knows? Maybe you know something. Maybe you have a friend that knows something. This is what we're talking about, ministry and unity. Last week I preached on unity, is that if the body is missing key components, it can't function like a well-oiled machine. If you don't have an arm, and I'm, I apologize to amputees, but it's just like one of those things where you can't function without your leverage. It's just like, oh, I need that. I need that body part. Or, hey, there's no eye of the body. The eye is missing. And the tongue is missing, the teeth are missing, the, the nostrils are missing, so the body can't function as God had intended it to. With this, y'all see what we're trying to do. We got a live stream going. We were this close, this close, this close, but it didn't kind of go the way we wanted it to. But that is totally okay. That is fine. If y'all could turn this down, because thank you. Can y'all, y'all can still hear me? Good. Turn the lights on. I don't want anybody falling asleep. This is not a deprivation chamber. This is church. But have y'all tried those? Those those are amazing. Do one. So my dad's sermon that he wanted me to speak on and what I spoke on the first service is called repair or rebuilding, repairing, and renewing lives. Three R's in your life that's going to make a huge success for transformation, for unity, for getting your place to where it needs to go on the right track. So he starts off is celebrating the heart and purpose of, God, uh, of the gospel. What is the point of that? The heart of our message is Jesus, and our purpose is to spread it. So we live and we have our relationship with God to spread his gospel, to spread his message, to spread everything that Jesus came here to do on this planet Earth. He said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to love everybody like I loved you, and I want you to share the gospel, make disciples before he ascended into heaven like nothing happened. So that's our mission as Christians, as Christ followers, is that we are supposed to be sharing the love of Christ, we're supposed to be making disciples, and we're supposed to be loving people throughout that whole process. That's our job. It's not like, oh, well, I need to go feed the homeless this day, or check, and then, oh, I need to go um, 
make blankets for all the homeless, check, which is that stuff that you should be doing anyway out of the kindness of your own heart, but it shouldn't be as complicated as church and or people have made it out to be. So let's go with the first step. So the first step is it's going to be heart for all people from every background. Heart for all people from every background. Let's see what let's see what we're getting at with this one. Go to Luke 13. And let me know when you're there, or you know what, they're going to have it on the screen, so y'all are already there, that's fine. I'm old school. So it says, Jesus entered Jericho, and as he was passing through a man by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector, tax collector, and he was very wealthy. Over the, uh, he wanted to see Jesus, but because he was short in stature, he could, couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, Jesus... Uh, uh, Jesus reached the spot. He looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down from there immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down, and once he welcomed him gladly, um, the people all saw and began to murder. Um, not murder, goodness. My bad. He gone, uh, he's like, he's going to go over to his house. Does he want a sinner he is? And so once he got there, he had a change of heart, and he says, Lord, look. Here I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody of anything, I will pay them back four times. Four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save that was lost. We've all heard that song, Father Abraham and many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. That's actual literal sense. We're all descendants of Abraham. So we all have that connection to where where Jesus was even saying to even Zacchaeus, a guy that was hated, he was a tax collector. Now, back in those days, tax collectors, you know, they could do whatever pretty much they wanted to your money. If they say, hey, you know what, you only pay 100 bucks as a taxes a month, but if whatever reason said, okay, well, I'm going to make you pay $150 in taxes this month, you couldn't argue or you could have gone to jail. That's how much power they had. So a lot of tax collectors were known for cheating. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, well, I normally pay $100. Well, why is, why is it 150 Oh, well, you know, we got to do an upcharge, all that stuff. And no, no one could keep them in check, and no one could be any of the wiser. No one could do anything about it. So tax collectors back then were not the most sought out for people. They were just like, oh, great, here comes the tax collector. Let's, let's try to get out the way, you know, everyone was trying to everyone was trying to avoid but the fact that jesus called him out and he looked right at him in that tree he's like hey come down i want to stay at your house so the keys hurried down okay 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 and so then just like some people in your life maybe it's at church maybe it's at your home maybe it's extended family maybe it's at work they began to murder does jesus not know what kind of a sinner this guy is wait a minute you want it you jesus wants to use him as a pastor, do you not know what he's done? Do you not know what his mama did back in 1973? And God wants to use him? God wants to do her? Do you know, man, I can, I can tell you stories of what she did on the street. But God wants to use her? What? That happens a lot. And in church, it's, it's more prevalent than ever. It's really sad. You know, I've been through a lot of churches. I've been to growing up, my, you know, being a pastor's child. I've been to a lot of churches. I've been to everything, and I've seen behind the scenes, you know, because there's, there's what they do in front of you, and then when closed doors happens, some of these pastors and some of these people that are in ministry, total opposite. And so I've seen, I've seen what the issues have, and it was funny because I was a um, place I used to work at, a whole bunch of atheists, Satanists, people that wouldn't give the Bible a time of day. But you know what? They had my back more than my Christian brothers and sisters did. They knew I was Christian. They knew I, they knew I had served the Lord. They know, they know that how I feel about that. But they also saw how I carried myself and how caring I am towards them, even though we're on different ends of the spiritual spectrum. Satanists! <laughs> Just like... Hail Satan, I worship Satan. That's the kind of stuff that they were saying. But because I didn't shun them and because I didn't judge them and because I just showed the love of Christ, they're like, man, we got your back in there. What you need? Do you need any help with anything? Is something going on? Is, is everything okay? I remember when I got into a car wreck, this is about, man, about six, five or six years ago. They had somewhere how they were all called, hey, are you okay? 
are you okay? What's going on? Is everything all right? Hey, do you need anything? Does your family need anything? And maybe two people from my church family called me. So just because you're in this building, just because you're in this church, just, be, just because you may claim to be a Christian all your life, doesn't mean that we are ready to support one another. So let's continue. Let's go on. So Zacchaeus had a, and, and, and actually let me say this. So when Jesus came to his house, Jesus asked him, he's like, okay, Zacchaeus, can I come to your house? Zacchaeus said, yes, he answered the call. Zacchaeus answered the call. So he was seeking out rebuilding. And then after he had that meeting with Jesus, what happened? His whole mindset and his spiritual mindset did a complete 180. So not only did he have that encounter with Jesus, but his heart and his mind changed. From a tax collector that loved money, that was rich, very, very wealthy, wanted to do all this, was cheating people out of money constantly, he had a love for money. To all of a sudden saying, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. To all of a sudden, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will return it tenfold. No one just decides that. No one just decides after doing that for so many years, day by day by day, all of a sudden just says, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to give away half my possessions. And, I'm a, and if I ever cheated anybody, I'm going to go back and pay them fourfold. So he had an encounter and the Lord was starting to rebuild, and he began to repair. And then on the, top, on the top of the thing of that, Jesus renewed his life. So after that day, Zacchaeus was a whole new creation. He had a different mindset, different heart change, and he had, was a new creation, but only because God himself, Christ the Son, was there in his house to make that radical change. Jesus didn't call him out and be like, you filthy, evil tax collector, yada, yada, yada. He didn't go for the jabs like a lot of us would go for today. Because honestly, that's one of my pet, pre my pet peeves. If I see somebody cheating somebody, seeing someone steal from somebody, that irks me. That really is an injustice to me. And I hate seeing that. But at the same time, Jesus was so chill and gentle, he was just like, hey, let me go chill at your house. Let's, let's eat, let's talk. And yeah, when you're going through changes, people may know your past, and the people who know you from your past, they might be saying, oh, look, now, now she's trying to go to church. Look at her. Oh, look at him. Oh, man, he's been sheeting up drugs for the last 20 years and been in God knows what. Now look at him try to get his life together. That's real. That's very real. But you have to ignore that. If you're going through something like that, we do not judge. We do not hold that against you. They call it your past for a reason. You can't change the past, but you sure can change the future. That's something that we always need to be looking forward. I have a buddy of mine. He's said this to me so many times, and it's really stuck in my brain. He said, if you're driving forward, if you're going to keep looking in the rearview mirror or looking back, eventually you're going to wreck. <laughs> Don't let the stuff of the past hold you back. And same vice versa. If you see somebody trying to do better with themselves, if you see someone that you're like, oh, well, look, they're finally coming to the altar. Don't. Don't discourage them. Don't talk bad about them. Because they're here to get help. They're here to get saved. This is a place, the church isn't a place for us Christians to come sit and have a jolly good time and laugh about the football game yesterday. This is a hospital. This is a place where the wounded will be healed, where chains will be broken, where mindsets will be changed, where things that they've known all their life, they have to unlearn and give it to God so that he can make them a new creation. That's what this is. And people are the most vulnerable here. You have to understand, people have been, there's a lot of people in here right now or who come through these doors who have been in survivor mode their whole life. Not knowing where they're going to eat, not knowing if someone's going to going to uh, mess them over, not, not, not sure what the outcome is going to be. I'm being real with you. I've been in church, and my dad told me, cracked me, he was like, you haven't been in church all your life. I was like, well, you're pastors, and, you know, whatever, two days old, yada, 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 so well, it kind of works. But I've seen it happen. I've seen people who have come in, and you have these, these uh, you have, we've had prostitutes, drug dealers, drug takers, drug abusers, all these people's drunks. We've had them walk through this walk through doors, not these doors specifically, and I've seen the congregation tear them up with their eyes. And it was so thick, you could cut it with a butter knife. 
something that we're supposed to be, come on in, it doesn't matter what you've done, you're here now, let us help you. Let us help you make you be, be a new creation, because it stinks going through that by yourself. And it's hard to fall back on those old things because they are familiar. But if you have a great support system, if you have a great body, if you have great friends, if you have true friends in Christ, say, hey, man, just calling in today. How you doing? Is there anything I can pray for you about? Stuff that's been bugging you? Have you been struggling? What's that? You took another sip of alcohol? Hey, you know what? I'm praying with you right now. I'm not going to judge you. Like, oh, you heathen. Ah, you know, alcohol, you smoke, yada, yada, yada. That's not the point. You ruin your ministry that way. Your, your ministry is destroyed. If you come at somebody attacking somebody, they're already going to do like this. You're not going to have good success. But what did Jesus do when he was talking to the prostitute, talking to the murderer? How you doing? What's going on? You're a new creation. You're no longer having to do those things. Pick up your bed and walk. But yet we have human emotions. We go through everything else just like anybody else does. And we let our pride, our feelings, our anger, our bitterness guide our heart rather than the love of Christ. And that's it. Let's go on. Rebuilding, repairing, renewing. The next point, a desire to experience restoration. God plans to restore everything, not just some things. I used this example before in the last service, and I was talking to guys, and I was talking to females, and I was just like, guys, we love when things are restored. I said, I can go on Facebook, watch people rebuild a 67 Mustang all day long, and before I know it, the 45-minute video is up. I love watching things be restored. I love watching, watching them uh, sandblast the frame, paint the front, prime it, put in the engine, restore engine parts, restore everything, put it all together put that candy coat paint on it and be like, oh my gosh, that is beautiful. I love it, I love it. Especially like with old antique tools. It's people, they get them and they put them in the solution. They're using the solution to make it shine and they're cleaning it and they're reapplying and redoing all this stuff and it looks brand new. I also love iron forging. Goodness, that, that is just one of the things I've always wanted to do. Picking up old metal, picking up old material, burning it down, getting all the impurities out, reforging it into something miraculous. And for you women, I told, I told the story of my wife. She likes to go to, uh, she likes to, go to uh, Habitat for Humanity, and she's like, babe, look, I found this table. Oh, my gosh, we can repurpose it. We can do it. We can do it. it came with all the chairs. Look at it. I got it for 20 bucks. It's awesome. We can do this. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, so go, go do your thing. And then they're sanding, whoosh, sanding it all, repurposing, painting, priming, doing all that stuff. And for her, that's her. She loves to restore that, that kind of thing. She's also a very fantastic gardener. She loves to garden. Her and her father love to garden. So every time when we're there in Hawaii, he's like, okay, hey, I got the ginger ready. You guys want to come up to the, my garden and, and uh, dig up the ginger? Or we can dig up the peanuts. We got guavas. We got pineapples. We got all this stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> pineapple from Hawaii. Can't beat it. It's, it's totally different from what we have here. So it's restoring in the restoration process. And when God is saying, okay, when we say, Lord God, you know, come into my life, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, God is popping his fingers, he's like, all right, let the reforging begin. But in that process, like how we have to be sanded, how we have to be put through the fire to get the impurities out, like we have to be hammered and we have to be reshaped, that's what it is for us. So you're going to feel that heat, you're going to feel that pressure, you're going to feel that stress, you're going to feel like the old you is breaking and, it's, and God is molding you into something new and it's going to be uncomfortable and it's all change is uncomfortable, but at the end, the result is pristine We don't grow without pressure. We don't grow without things hurting. That's why they call them growing pains. And it's just like there was a doctor, he's a Jewish rabbi, and he was talking about the middle state of people who, and, and mind you, I'm not talking against anybody that uses any uh, Percocets or anything, but it's supposed to help the mind through anxiety. And seeing patients when I used to work in the medical field, anxiety is a big thing. It's a huge thing. It's a really big thing. 
But it's just saying that even sometimes in life, some people abuse it because they can't deal with things, but then some people actually need it. And he was saying, for the people who don't need it, what they are doing is like, he's like, consider a lobster. Consider, consider a lobster. A lobster has a shell, but then as it grows, it has to leave that shell and go make another one. The shell reproduces, right? So he, sh he sheds, the sh sheds the shell, and then he has to rebuild another one from, from his skin. So some people, they don't want to deal with the growing pains. They want to stay right there. It's like, you know what, let me just take something so I'm comfortable instead of allowing themselves to deal with the issues, allowing themselves to go through the natural process of things so that they can have freedom and then they can stretch out and do whatever the Lord has called them to do. Any kind of growth takes pain. Any kind of growth takes dying to yourself, just like a seed. A seed has to die for the tree to live. You have to die to yourself every day. And that's terrible, and, it's, and it stinks sometimes because you're just like, oh, this is, not, this is not comfortable. I don't like it, but it is necessary. And so we're going to read Ezekiel uh, 34, verse, starting with 11. And it says, for thus says the Lord God, God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As for talk, uh, I will also find my scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all places where they, they were scattered on that cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples that gather them in the countries, and I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their uh, fold shall be as high as the mountains of Israel. So right there, we're already talking about the shepherd. So Jesus is the shepherd. We're his flock. Jesus is saying, hey, if one of you goes missing, I'm going to leave the 99 where they're at. They're safe. I'm going to come find you. So what does that mean? Why do we apply that for today? That means that you are not small enough. Or let me say it like this. You are not worthless that God is not going to come find you. You might think, oh, but it's just me. I'm just one person. I don't have any value to God. You have more value than you know. And he will leave the 99 to go find you. Now, um, excuse me. <coughs> My goodness, sorry. So now let's go, we'll also go that. And uh, a lot of shepherds, what they do when sheep wander off, sometimes a lot of the shepherds would actually break the legs of the sheep, forcing the sheep to lean on the shepherd. Forcing, because if he because if he let him go, what's stopping him from? Oh, I'm just going to go back and yada yada yada. So sometimes God will let those circumstances that we go through. Sometimes God will let the consequences break us, so that we can go back to Him. So we can say, Okay, God, what was on your heart? What did I do wrong? What is your view for me? What is your plan for me? And so we begin to embrace Him. It's just like my son, and I love him to death. But sometimes I'll be like, all right, son, stop running. You got to be careful. You'll slip. You're wearing socks. And he'll run and he'll slip and he'll fall. He's like, ah, I ain't crying. I'm like, all right, come here, come here. And then I embrace my son and I'm like, okay, Logan, what happened? Oh, well, I slipped. Okay, why did he slip? Because I was running with socks on. Okay, so next time you have to be careful. And so I explain. He's looking at me. He's like, what did I do? And so, and so it takes that time of brokenness. Of even when my son, when he's hurt, he rushes to me. And I say, it's okay, it's okay, it's fine. But this is what we need to work on. You need to work on your listening. <laughs> Daddy told you not to run with socks, and look what happened five seconds later. And so it's stuff like that for us as his children and as his sheep is that he'll allow us to go through it. He'll allow us to go through the consequences of our actions. But he does it with love and care. And he'll teach us and he'll show us our wrongdoings. Let's go to, um, so we've already done rebuilding, repairing, renewing. Uh, the next point, a plan to serve together, serving for the common good. So, so like, like I said last week, while I was preaching last week, unity, unity is everything. Unity is everything in the church, not only in church, but in families, at work, military. If you've been in the military, you know that you need to function as one unit or your whole mission and your crew can be compromised. And that can be deadly. 
So that's why they're beating into you in those trainings. They're like, you need to function as a unit. There is no individuality in this unit, in the Army, in the Navy, in the Marines. Everybody is part of a team sharing the same goal. There's no time to think about, oh, well, I think we need to do it this way. There's no room for that in the military. There's none. Neither is there any room for that in God's military. We're all soldiers. We all have missions. And there's only one mission that we should be following, only one heart that we should be following, only one mindset that we should be following, and that's his. Now, that's not to say that God won't give you things. God won't give you tidbits of information. God won't tell you to do other things otherwise. But when it comes as a unit of the church, we need to be on the same mindset. Not saying that we have to learn the same, not saying that we have to speak the same language, not saying that we have to constantly compromise our own ideals and all that stuff, because I, get, I do believe that God gives us ideas for a reason. But it has to go to the proper channels, and we have to be unified over the head of this household. There's a reason why people are in leadership. The Lord puts those people in their leadership. And I know a lot of people are upset with the election. I know that. But at the end of the day, God knows what he's doing. We may not understand because we only think like this. We only see like this. What's in front of us? We're like, oh, well, what's going on? This is not good. Yada, yada, yada. But God is like, okay, I see everything. And in order for his will to be done, some things just has to happen. It doesn't mean you lose faith. It doesn't mean that God betrayed you. It doesn't mean that God hates you. He's just like, oh, my kids aren't praying enough. Punishment. You know, he's not like that. He's not like that at all. Is that there's things that we need to be focusing as Christians, and we need to be still relevant to the world. We still need to have that drive. But ultimately, even when the enemy thinks he's won, or if we think that, oh, this is the, the world is getting worse, God is still in control. We just don't understand. We don't know his plan. We don't know what he's doing. And I'd rather say it that way. Because I can't imagine what's going on in his mind. I'm just like, oh, God, that's scary. <laughs> you know, it's just, just something where I've come to play. I'm like, okay, God, whatever happens, you're still God. There's no man, there's no government, there's no teacher, there's no principal, there's no king, there's no queen, there's no ruler, there's no dictator that can ever outdo you. And that's what I'm going to believe to the day I die. So let's go on and say, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And it says, They uh, continued to steadfastly in the apostles' in the fellowship in breaking of the bread and in prayers. They Fear, uh, then fear came upon every soul, uh, and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Now, all believed were together and had all things in common. So they sold their possessions and goods and divided all, all, all to anyone that was in need. So, continuing daily in accordance with the breaking of bread from the house to house, and they ate, ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having uh, for having favor on all the people. And the Lord added to the daily those who were being saved. So the apostles were giving up everything to make sure that their brothers and sisters were taken care of. That's how intent they were unified. They were just saying, hey, if you're struggling, we're all struggling as a body. Let's help them out. If you see somebody struggling, you don't have to blast it. That's not what God wants. God wants you to be obedient. God wants you to help them. God wants you to do whatever you can. It's encouragement. Maybe they need, uh, you don't know what people need. It could be the smallest thing. If you can do it, that just builds the body up even more. And don't expect anything in return. Be like, okay, I'll loan you $500. If the Lord calls you, give $500. Hey, don't expect those $500 back. That's the mindset we need to have in ministry. It's not about, okay, I'll give you this, but I'll give you this. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. It doesn't work like that. The mindset shouldn't work like that at all. So when you, God calls you to give something, please don't expect it back. That's not the right heart to have. You need to have a cheer, cheerful heart. Because it's nothing worse than someone helping you 
And then they lean over, okay, I've helped you, now you've got to help me. Nothing worse in the world. That's why I hate loans. That's why I hate home loans. That's why I hate auto loans. That's why I hate credit cards. You know, God forbid, you know, financially, you know, we're, we're better off now. But when we first got married, there were times when we had to use a credit card. And the credit card's like, oh, you can pay me and have a limit of $8,000 if you want. But I'm going to charge you interest every month. And you got to pretty much pay like six times just to get it paid down to zero and let you pay it all off in a month. But I'll gladly help you out. But debt. Trust. I hate it. I don't like it. But that's what we live in today. So the mindset of the whole world has changed. That I'll help you out, but you owe me. That's where we've been. that's where we've come. All right, let me go ahead and wrap this up here. I'm gonna go give you some principles of helping others. Encourage and build up others. Like I said before, if you see somebody struggling, especially a new believer, you know their past. Oh well, I knew them in high school. They've always been this way. Yada, yada, yada. There's no help for them. They're just going to go back, do the same stuff that they were doing. There's no walk in that opposition. Because you can be that light. And you not even realize it. I had an old friend. She contacted me. Well, we went to high school together. I mean, she had, uh, she, she left the high school not on good terms. It was a lot of drama. Uh, kind of created a big scene. And so a couple weeks, about last week, she found me on uh, Facebook, and she was, I was like, oh, wow. I said, I haven't talked to this person since 2008. I was like, oh, my God, here we, here we go. <laughs> you know, I was kind of expecting the worst, but she was talking to me, and she was like, hey, Adrian, what's going on? I was like, hey, what's going on? How have you been? And, you know, and I talked to her dad because her dad was one of our patients, and I was just like, yeah, I heard you have a, have a kid now. He's like, oh, I have three, yada, 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 and I was telling him, you know, about our family, and then she was like, hey, she said, I just need a thank you. And I was like, thank, thank me for what? We haven't spoke in 12 years. Like, what do, you, what do you have to thank me for? She said, when I was going through all that stuff and after I left the school, a lot of the stuff that you were encouraging me to deal with and, and to finally deal with it for myself, it resonated even to this day. All the encouragement you gave, all the biblical references, everything that you gave me 12-something-odd years ago, really helped me get through things and help me deal with my own issues. And something to say, that was really humbling, because here I am, I didn't think anything of it, I never thought that she was going to call me or text me 12 years later and say, hey, I just want to appreciate you for being a light. Even though you were made fun of for being a Christian in a Christian school, <laughs> spoiler alert, <laughs> even though I was made fun of for not being a stereotype of a black person, because they didn't have no black folks at that school, I was the first black kid to graduate from BCS, and it was there 25 years before I even got there. Christian school, Bradsport, and I'm, I'm sure it's better now. I should say that, disclaimer. But this is what I dealt with, even in a Christian environment. Constantly judging me, constantly looking at me. Why don't you do this? Why don't you dress this way? Oh, AJ, you're not a thug, and I'm just like, you're not a thug either, sir. So how, do you, how can you judge? Everybody wants to be gangster until the police show up. So, <laughs> I mean, that's my motto. Everybody's a gangster until the police show. Oh, woo! You know, they all, they all scat. You know, they all scatter. But I had to, at a young age, even in my teens, I had to say, Lord, I choose you and nothing else matters. Nothing else matters to me. Yeah, it was rough. It was tough. I was made fun of. I was looked down upon. I was laughed at. I was ridiculed. But even though that my one classmate called me and said, you know what, I want to thank you for being a liar. It made it all worth it. You never know how your kindness, how your gentleness, how the Holy Spirit can shine through you if you allow him to. Even if, it think, if you think it's not doing anything to anybody, you never know. So let's go ahead and close today. Let's go ahead and, and we'll go over those points again. So we've already talked about having a heart for all people from every background. Everyone comes from different cultures, different languages, different ethnicities, different everything. Not Your world is not the whole world for everybody. 
the way I do things isn't necessarily things that they do on the opposite side of the world. Prime funny example, when my wife and I went to Nepal for two and a half months, ten years ago, one thing that they told us not to do, she was like, Adrian, she said, do not look a woman in the eye. And I'm like, what? She said, in America, that's all we're taught. In interviews, you look people in the eyes when you're talking to them. You, you make eye contact, you never look down, you never look away. So, and I was like, well, okay, if, if I do, what happens? That, that, he was like, that means that you're interested and you're interested to marry. And I was like, whoa, okay, duly noted. So I had to learn to be like, hi, AJ, what's going on? Oh, I'm doing good. Yeah, everything is great. Everything is wonderful. Uh, yeah, I went to that, uh, that rice shack the other day. Oh, it was fantastic. They're standing right here, and I'm looking like I'm having like a seizure, like trying to like not look at their eyes. And so it's something that is different. So we all have to realize that everybody is different, and no one has the same culture or someone, no one has the same traditions as we do. Always have to think about that. Next step was a desire to experience restorations. God's plan to restore everything. God is not just going to work on your heart and then not work on your mind. He's not going to work here and not where. He wants the whole kit and caboodle. He wants everything. And that can, sometimes can add pressure to us. That can, that can cause us to be like, oh, man, I'm really, I'm really heart torn. I really shouldn't be doing this. But, and I know I'm a new creation, so you're going to have that internal struggle. The rest, restoration process takes time. Give yourself time. Just because if you say a prayer to me doesn't mean that you're going to have it all figured out by tomorrow. I guarantee it. I've been living the godly life as far as I can remember, and I still struggle. I'm never going to get to the point where I'm like, okay, God, I know everything. I don't need you anymore. See you, dude. I'll see you up there. No, that's never going to happen, even if I live to a thousand. Next up was a plan for the common good of all. Unity, 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 unity. We need to build each other up. We need to constantly help out our brothers and sisters and encourage them. That's our job. And I, I hate to say it like this, and I, hate to, and I hate to bring up the past, but sometimes you have to learn from your past so you don't make the same mistakes in the future. When we first came to this church back in 20, oh, I was about to say 2002, but that's wrong. In 2002, August of 2002, my family and I, we first started going to this church. And I tell you what, this place was damn packed. Jam packed. Now, considering half the church was either a Leha or Tristan or Martinez back in the day, it was pretty much a big family. But I, you saw it there, that the community and the connection was there. It was constantly growing. People were inviting one another. People were saying, hey, hey, this is my cousin. And even when I was in youth back in those times, it was Acts 29, and we had many kids. We had, we had on average, 30 to 40 kids. And that's the average. I'm guaranteed every Wednesday and Sunday we saw somebody. My father would be like, is there anybody here for the first time? They'll raise their hand like, oh, we got these cheap little Brazos Port Christian Center mugs that are just for you. We got pins, 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 pins. And I'm here today, 18 years later. Wondering what in the world happened. I'm not meaning to be a downer. I'm just saying things that I've noticed. And I've been in ministry mostly all my life, and I've been in churches mostly all my life, and I've seen the rises and fall of churches. And I don't want this to be one of those that falls and that fell. We have some mindsets that we have to change in each and every single one of us. We have to put aside the petty grievances that have splintered us from our families. Because if we can't have unity, if we can't be unified in Christ, what makes us think that he will allow us to have this unity of us? I know there's drama. I know people are going to say stuff. People are going to talk about you one day. You die and you might as well just be But I challenge you. 
I know this year was a little wonky. We had Rona. We had <laughs> after Kobe died, everything went downhill. I'll say it like that. After Kobe died, everything went downhill, and that was like right smack dab at the beginning of January this year. But no matter what happens, what government's going to continue to try to push? No gatherings, but you can go on a plane. No gatherings, but you can go to a bar. We need to work over this. We have a mission that no government, no president, man, ruler can ever change. So I encourage you, get involved, get plugged in, get unified. And I guarantee you, change our mindset now in 2021 oh but I can't make time make time oh but I don't like this person get over with work out the details make peace you not understand that's what God calls us to do is to make peace with one another and live in peace. As quickly as they offend you, the Lord says, quickly let it go. Water off the dust. Let's go ahead and pray. Don't bow your heads. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had. Lord, as you begin the process to renew our minds, our hearts, our spirits, Lord. Let you be the forefront. Lord, we're tired of doing things our way. We're tired of doing it the way that we've been doing it for years and it's not been working. But we ask you, what is on your part? What is your mission for our church? What hurts your heart? like that fire in our heart so that we can say, you know what, the Lord has given me a talent to do this, the Lord has given me passions for this, the Lord gives me talent for this, I want to use them to better the kingdom. We pray that that fire renews in this generation. In your heavenly name, amen. Thankful for a good word today, amen? Thankful to be in the house of the Lord today, amen? <laughs> we had some technical difficulties. Hopefully they can work that out and maybe at another time. <laughs> I know y'all are feeling like, whoa, <laughs> for a minute there. But uh, we're so glad that you're here. We're going to close out with one song, and you're welcome to leave out as we sing, or you can just stay here and sing with us if you want. But uh, we just pray you're blessed this week. Enjoy your week this week knowing that you walk in the favor of the Lord. Amen.
gonna sing a little louder than before. Oh, I wanna spin a little wilder than before. Come on, lift your voices. I gotta shout louder than before. And I'm gonna sing No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Sing it a little louder. Come on. Say no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. No more shackles. No more shackles, no more chains. No more bondage, I am free, yeah. One more time. No more shackles, no more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free, yeah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Welcome to Destiny Church. This is Adrian Johnson here to give you your announcements. Merry Christmas and let the seasons bring its greetings. On Wednesday, December 9th, Kids Connection will be putting on a kids program. It's going to be titled A Christmas Story. You do not want to miss it. Please join us for this fabulous time. Also for K-Motion, on December 13th, which is a Sunday, there's going to be a kids pajama party. Please have your kid dress in appropriate pajamas as they have fun and activities for that Sunday. On Sunday, December 20th, please join us for our Christmas service. Bring your friends and family as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will not want to miss it. Our Growth Track program will also be kicking off again. There we will help you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and join a team. It's going to be on the first and second Sunday of each month at 9 a.m. Sign-ups are going to be in the back. Thank you for joining us at service today. Whether if you're in person or online, God can still do miraculous things through us. Please enjoy the service and God bless. <laughs>